Hello everybody, uh, this is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Uh, the, this is episode number 14 uh, on the study of heaven. We've been using this book by Randy Alcorn uh, as our guide. The title of the book is Heaven. The author is Randy Alcorn, and we're basically reading and discussing the book. Uh, if you haven't seen the first 13 episodes, each episode's two hours long, so <laughs> we've already talked about heaven for 26 hours, and uh, there's still a lot to be said about it, a lot to learn about it. So uh, it, that's one of the amazing things to me is, is how comprehensive this, this subject is, how much there is to learn and, and say about it. So uh, if you haven't seen the first 13 episodes, go to my YouTube channel, Sin City Preacher, uh, and the first 13 episodes are already up there. So uh, let me introduce the panelists. Uh, we've got Brother Eric. Hi, everyone. Jesus Knight 72. Glad to be here, uh, as always. Okay. Thank you, Brother, for coming. I didn't get my special effects up yet. No, I yeah. see if I can get that on operating here because we definitely don't want to. Uh, there. We don't want you to be uh, introduced without the traditional. Uh, you know, there's millions of people watching, and I know that they all want to <laughs> applaud you for being here. <laughs> Next, we got Brother Austin. Hey everybody, this is Austin. My channel's name is Austin Bell. Do ministry called Christ Ministries, and glad to be here as always. Okay, thank you, brother. Okay, when we stopped last time, uh, we were on page 169 uh, on Randy Alcorn's book, so I made a note where we left off. Let me just start reading that and see if we've got our, our thoughts on, on his comments. Uh, when Christ died, he might have appeared to shed his humanity, but when he rose in an indestructible body, he declared his permanent identity as the God-man. J.I. Packer writes, quote, By incarnation, the Son became more than he was before, and a human element became integral to the ongoing life of the uh, triune God. Christ glorified humanity, which is the template, template and link for the glorification that is ours, must go on forever, unquote. This is a mystery so great it should leave us breathless. That's a very interesting uh, premise, isn't it? Uh, I think we talked about this a little bit in the past, is that uh, uh, is Jesus' incarnation, uh, was it um, always, was, was it um, eternal? Or did he, did he take on human flesh at in Bethlehem when he was born as baby Jesus, was that the first, uh, the, the origin of his incarnation as Jesus, this God manifest in the flesh? And then is it after his death, burial, and resurrection, is, is his existence as this uh, glorified human body, but God in flesh, is this eternal? Is it always going to be? Uh, will he always exist in that state? So that's uh, that's the premise here by J. I. Packer. Uh, what do you guys think of that? Have you considered that before? I have heard that mentioned before, and I've heard two different I've heard two different opinions about that in eternity. That one was that uh, obviously, like you just stated, Christ was going to remain. Um, uh, the separate personage of him in the flesh through through the millennium, then into eternity, um, and then I've also heard another opinion that um, that the Son and the Father and the Spirit will become one in eternity, and we will just know him as one God again. You know, as one God, there will be no need for the separate personalities of him. That you know, so, so I mean, yes, I have thought about that. Yes. Mm -hmm. You have any leanings on that? Well, we know we know separately in the millennium that Christ is going to uh, stay as we know Christ. Um, we know that. I mean, not a lot about eternity is really revealed. Um, it it kind of goes along the line of the concept when there's a new heaven, there's a new earth. Um, that 
things will all be new, and so that relationship can can turn can kind of continue to where people say in the garden, God walked with Adam and Eve, He talked with Adam and Eve. That you know, so it would go back to that kind of relationship where there's just just knowing God as the one as one entity. Then you know, Father, Son, Holy Spirit will be one in the in the Father, and um. I, I guess they both have credence. I mean, they're they're both reasonable. I don't see anything unreasonable with either uh, mm -hmm. opinion. Okay, let's get Austin's reaction to that. What what do you think of that premise, Austin? Uh, this is meaning a new relationship. Is this am I correct? No, we're talking about uh, you know the God. The Bible says God is spirit, and yet that we go, we know that God became flesh, uh, became a man named Jesus Christ, and He died for our sins. He was buried. He uh, was raised from the dead. He has a glorified body, and he ascended uh, up to uh, to heaven, the intermediate heaven, where he is now, and he's sitting at the right hand of the Father. So this is what we know from scriptures, uh, and we are assuming that he still exists in a physical form as this God made flesh right now in the inter intermediate heaven. Uh, do you think that he will continue to exist in the flesh throughout eternity, and or and also, do you think that he was God in the flesh, all from the beginning of time and uh, even before the incarnation uh, of baby Jesus? Uh, I'm not exactly sure yet. I'll I'll think about it and I'll, I'll hold my thought till the end. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think that uh, Randy's going to have as we go through here uh, some references for to con on this uh, for us to consider. Uh, but my first question would be, can you think of anything in the scriptures that tells us that Jesus is going to lose his uh, flesh at any point in the future? No, I mean, uh, no. No. So because, because I don't know of any scripture that says he will no longer exist in the flesh, then I don't know why it's, uh, you know, I, we, I don't think we should just assume that that, that is the case. Unless, unless it says somewhere, or at least alludes to it. Yeah, right. and I, I and I. Listen. Go ahead. Uh, no, I was just going to say, if I had to be pinned down to a to a, you know, an answer, I'd say I do lean more towards that. I mean, the idea that he, we know he is separate during the millennium, then into eternity. I mean, it says there's going to be a new heaven and new earth. Um, I do tend to believe that that Christ uh, in his flesh as we're going to be in in our perfected flesh, our new flesh. Um, uh, I tend to lean toward that, that he'll stay in that kind of relationship with us through eternity. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. I was just, I was just going to say that I, I don't disagree he came in the flesh. It's just the idea that was he in the flesh before – um, he came down to earth. Um, that would be a new. That would be a new one for me to consider. That's all. I was just trying yeah. to think about. Mm -hmm. uh, it would be, but it, it also gives us a new. Uh, I don't want necessarily say new, but uh, a way of looking at this uh, statement in the scriptures that man was made in God's image. Mm -hmm. Therefore, I mean, we have we have flesh, and so if we're made in God's image, I think that it's a logical link to draw that. Uh, um, maybe God had had flesh uh, from the beginning. Is it absolutely known too that angels are only spirit? Well, I think that the scriptures say that they're uh, spirit beings, but they somehow have, they have the ability to uh, appear 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 with bo with bodies and and, and yeah. physical physical uh, some kind of physical uh, manifestation. Yeah. I mean, we talked even we talked a little bit last time about the interaction they have with Lot and his family, and they came as two men. They were visitors. I mean, they Lot knew understood them as men, and they were angels. Okay. So, um, so to him, they were fleshly beings. They were in the flesh. So they could either maybe it's the fact that maybe they can appear in the flesh and then go back to a, a spirit being type of thing, or maybe they are like we talked about this before. And I know maybe I'm being a little redundant on it, but. Um, possibly they're they're a flesh that we don't quite understand. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's could another also, possibility too. Could it also be possible that um, everybody in, has the ability to either harness the flesh or get out of the flesh in heaven? Could it be a possibility that Christ, who had the flesh, could also have the choice to leave the flesh and then come back to the flesh? 
Because then that would make I mean, sense if I, he wasn't. That would make sense if he was in the flesh before he came down to Earth, because he would. Have I would say I would say that's a good question for him. For us, there's nothing to me in the scripture that insinuates that we'll go between spirit and flesh bodies. I mean, it 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 says that we're going to get new flesh bodies, this perfected bodies that are flesh that will take us into eternity. It doesn't really say we'll do that. I mean, I it, I don't know if we will be able to do that type of thing. I mean, for instance, our raptured body... Well, for instance, um, in a way, Jesus' body, his raptured body, did do those kind of things because we know he was able to appear in a room that was closed. We, he was able to do things a spirit could do even though he had a flesh body. He had a body that was touchable. So, the, again, you get into this whole... Where you talk about a spiritual body, it's one that's kind of like... that has these unique properties that it can change to the point where maybe it's semi-flesh or maybe it's we don't know. I mean, maybe, maybe there are things about it that we don't quite understand. But we can take things that Jesus did after he was resurrected as resurrected as things he did, and kind of say, is he showing us what we'll be able to do when we're in our raptured bodies? Mm -hmm. So there are similarities there to that. Yeah. Okay. Well, we did, we discussed in an earlier uh, um, episode that uh, the, we will have glorified bodies like Jesus's. Mm -hmm. And, and so if we, if we know that they're going to be like Jesus' glorified body, and then we know that he was able to appear and, and disappear, and, and then also uh, I've mentioned the concept of shape-shifting just because he appeared to people and they didn't recognize him, and then they recognized him. I, I, I don't know if they were just um, like blinders on and couldn't see him, or the sun was in their eyes, or, or was he just changing his physical form so they could recognize him or not? I don't know, but uh, if Jesus did that, then uh, it's logical to assume then that we will be able to do the things like that too in our glorified bodies. Okay, uh, it goes on to say, um, Job, in his anguish, cried out in a vision of striking clarity, quote, I know that my Redeemer lives, and that in the end he will stand upon the earth. And after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh I will see God. I myself will see him with my own eyes, I and not another. How my heart yearns within me, unquote. That's Job chapter 19. The anticipation of seeing God face to face in our resurrected bodies is heartfelt and ancient, quote, and we all with unveiled face beholding the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another, unquote. That's 2 Corinthians 3.18. Our glorification will increase as we behold God in his glory. Well, first let's talk about what Job said there. That uh, he says, after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh I will see God. I think that's a great passage that people forget exists. That is, uh, Job is a very old writing, and even Job, before anything was talked of the resurrection of the church and the rapture and our perfected bodies, here he was, and God had given him knowledge to the fact that he was going to have a flesh, a type of flesh body after he died. He he believed full well that he was going to have a, a flesh, a physical body when he died and, and to see God in it. Yeah, so this idea of a resurrection where we have our bodies, this flesh renewed, remade, restored, and improved with, as Brother Jackson says, with all of these uh, improvements, what's the word he used? Uh, Upgrades. Uh, uh, upgrades. Uh, you know, a, a human body that's greatly upgraded. Right. Uh, this is not just a New Testament idea. It's even uh, here in Job we see it. And I think that many people think Job is the oldest of all the, the books of the scriptures. Uh, so, Austin, were you familiar with that, being in Job? Yeah, I'm almost positive. Didn't he uh, – d who is this author again? The, the author of the book is Randy Alcorn. Yeah, didn't Randy Alcorn have a chapter before this about the resurrected bodies and how they were going to be the flesh and everything? Oh, we've been talking about this mm -hmm. for a while, quite a bit. But mm -hmm. uh, is there a significant? Now we're talking. Now we're talking about not only having a resurrected body, but we're talking about seeing God's face. That's where we were on the last episode. We're talking about what will it be like to actually see the face of God. Okay. Uh, and and uh, not and then not only see it the face of God, but in our physical body, 
We only existing mm -hmm. in a physical body, seeing the face of God. So I think what, what, what Austin started to ask, the significance of that I think is going to be made more clearly as we go through the book when you see some of the things that we can expect possibly in heaven. Uh, the significance of a physical body is going to is going to we're going to keep revisiting that because you're going to see this you're going to see the necessity of it for some of the things that are going to be happening in in heaven. The thing I find also interesting is where Job says it's a very part very slow part of that a very small part of that and he says I and not another. This idea that you're this whole different person who forgets your past and there's none of that and you don't remember that's not true. I mean those words right there to me are speaking to his person who he is his personality. Him as Job, you know, me as Eric, you, you as Luke. We are going to see God as the people we are, for who we are, our personalities, who we are. And not not these different people that don't remember ourselves or have no knowledge of what we did previously. Yeah, we talked quite a bit in previous episodes about the the uh, the fact that if somehow our memories were wiped clean, mm -hmm. then we would no longer be ourselves. So it would right. not be us in heaven. Unless we had our memories and our old identity, right? Okay, uh, we need not wait till the new earth to catch glimpses of God. We're told His quote invisible qualities can be clearly seen in what has been made. That's in Romans one twenty. Consider the trees, flowers, sun, rain, and the people around you. Yes, there's devastation all around us and within us. Eden has been trampled, burned, and savaged, yet the stars in the sky nevertheless declare God's glory, that's Psalm 19.1, as do animals, art, and music. But our vision is hampered by the same curse that infects all creation. One day both we and the universe will be forever cured of sin, and that day we will see God. Mm -hmm. Amen. Well, just all of creation. There's other scripture that talks about, uh, you know, you don't believe in God, well, just look around you. There's the evidence of God is creation. And uh, that really, uh, I, I often go back to, to studying uh, the science of creation, the, the, the universe, the, uh, um, uh, the molecules, the DNA, I'm trying to really. Uh, study that because I get so much in awe of, of the creation and, and, and it makes me so uh, uh, certain that this is not random. This is this is design. And so creation tells us that there is God, a designer, a creator. Okay. Um, what is the essence of eternal life? that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent, John 17, 3. Uh, our primary joy in heaven will be knowing and seeing God. Uh, when you think of all the things uh, we have to look forward to in eternity, uh, we're going to be going through all those things uh, for you know the foreseeable future in this book, talking about uh, great detail all the things uh, that we'll be we'll be doing and experiencing in eternity. But Randy's making the point that actually seeing God is going to be far greater than any other experience that we can we can ever have. I'm skipping ahead here to one page 173 down to the third paragraph, Eric. It says Eden's greatest attraction was God's presence. The greatest tragedy of sin and the curse was that God no longer dwelt with his people. His presence came back in a small but real way in the Holy of Holies, in the tabernacle and the temple. After the exile, Ezekiel saw God's Shekinah glory, his, his visible presence, leave the temple and the city a sad day for Israel. That's Ezekiel chapter 11. God's Shekinah glory returned in Christ, who tabernacled among us. That means took up temporary residence. Quote, we have seen his glory, unquote, 1 John 1.14. I mean, John 1.14. God's glory resides now in his people. The temple he, dwell, he indwells, 
1 Corinthians 3.17. But one day Christ will come and make a new people, a new earth, and a new universe in which we will dwell among his people fully and freely. So the first point you're making there is that the greatest attraction of um, was God's presence in the, in the Garden of Eden. I mean, you think Garden of Eden, that's paradise. I mean, how wonderful could it be? It's We probably can't even begin. We, we, we look at, I got married in Hawaii, and it's the most beautiful place I've ever seen, I, uh, on the island of Kauai. And Kauai is called the Garden Island because it's, it's one of the rainiest places on the earth. And because of all that rain, it's just a tropical paradise. It's by far the most beautiful place I've ever seen. And yet... That I think is a shadow, just a, a you know, a, a, like a dim view of what Eden would be like. Uh, Hawaii is like, you know, just uh, how could I say it? I hate to use that example of steroids again, you know. <laughs> but but, but we, we heaven, understand. heaven is like how uh, heaven would be like Hawaii on steroids it's just it was like many many times greater many multiples or to the to the tenth power you know of, of how much better it'll actually be for the garden and yet Randy makes the point here he says that God's the greatest attraction the greatest thing in the Garden of Eden in paradise was God's presence and yet we will have God's presence living among us in eternity What about that idea that uh, uh, the Shekinah glory with Ezekiel? I, I guess I had forgotten about that. Could, let's look up Ezekiel. Could you find that, Eric? Ezekiel 11.23. It says, After the exile, Ezekiel saw God's Shekinah glory, his visible presence, leave the temple and the city. Sure. Uh, Ezekiel 11.23 says, And the glory of the Lord went up from the midst of the city, and stood upon the mountain which is on the east side of the city. Hmm. So there's not. There, let me go a little further. Let me try and go. I just it pulls that one verse out, but let me see kind of what it says before. Because the verse before twenty two says, "Then did the cherubims lift up their wings, and the wheels beside them, and the glory of the God of Israel was over them above, and the glory of the Lord went up from the midst of the city and stood upon the mountain which is on the east side of the city. Afterwards, the Spirit took me up and brought me in a vision by the Spirit of God into Chaldea." to them of the captivity, so the vision I had seen went up from me. So this is what you know Ezekiel is speaking of. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, there's so much uh, throughout the scriptures that we, you know, no matter how much we study them, that you, you miss so much, you don't remember all the details, but but uh, the idea of the Shekinah glory, obviously it, the Shekinah glory is not there. So when did it leave? Um, Randy Elkhorn is saying this verse is the, the, des the point designating that the Shekinah glory left. Uh, and and he, to go a little further, to keep it in context, and the problem with this is when you start reading the Old Testament, you got to remember it's, sort of, it's a historical record. So you got to kind of read more sometimes than just a verse. Randy, I, I know Randy's kind of pinpointing the one verse, kind of, I think, in the hope that other people will finish the rest of the chapter, kind of look through the whole thing. But if you go ahead, you, you, you talk. he talks about, the Lord is talking about the reason why he does this in verse 12. Uh, he says, and ye shall know that I am the Lord, for ye have not walked in my statutes, neither executed my judgments, but have done after the manners of the heathen that are round about you. So this is why he's preparing to to leave. You know, he's preparing to go. He's letting them know you've you've gone after all these other things, the, all these other ways that I've told you not to do. So you, you got to just keep it and read that whole chapter. It would probably be better for somebody if you're watching to go ahead and read that whole chapter to get an idea what the story of Ezekiel is relating. <clears throat> mm-hmm. Yeah, um, but yeah, we know that God had the Shekinah glory in the tabernacle mm -hmm. in, the, in the temple, and now there is no temple. There is no tabernacle. There is no Holy of Holies. There is no Ark of the Covenant, and the Shekinah glory is gone. And uh, so I guess this is the time and the circumstances which God's Shekinah glory left this world. And, and then he says that, in Jesus Christ, we see this glory return, mm -hmm. the glory of God. Um, I, I like to, when I'm witnessing, I like to, that last video I made about uh, homemade Bible tracts, one of the things I pointed out is that uh, we all fall short of the glory of God. Mm -hmm. 
And to me, uh, the, this was really referring to Jesus Christ because the Bible says that uh, God does not share his glory, but with Jesus and God and the Father share the glory. Therefore, they're both God. So uh, Jesus is this glory of God, and he is this standard that we all fall short. We come short of uh, being like Jesus. You know, you'd have to be uh, perfect, and you'd have to be God to meet this standard of uh, uh, meeting the glory of Jesus Christ, or the mm -hmm. glory of God. Um, and now that Jesus Christ has left, and he's sitting at the right hand of the Father, uh, Randy Elkhorn says that, that this glory is in, this, in the Holy Spirit, and it, that is indwelling uh, Eric and Austin, and myself and everyone who put their faith in our Savior, Jesus. <laughs> Uh, the Apostle John was Christ's dearest friend on earth, but when John saw Jesus in heaven, he, quote, fell at his feet as though dead, unquote. That's Revelation 1.17. Mm -hmm. We will see Christ in his glory. The most exhilarating experiences on earth, such, uh, all right, I don't want to go any further, such as white waters, rafting, skydiving, extreme sports, will seem compared to the thrill of seeing Jesus. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so that is amazing, you know. And John, you know, he he spent these three years with Jesus. Uh, he's called the beloved apostle. And, um, uh, and yet, here when he sees the uh, Jesus in his glory, he falls face prone at it, on the ground and yeah and we've asked this question before you know how will we react when we first see Jesus face to face <laughs> okay let, now we're going to uh, chapter 18 and uh, one of the things I've mentioned so many times about what I like about Randy's book is that each chapter and even throughout the chapter he has poses many questions for us and this chapter uh, it poses the question, what will it mean for God to dwell among us? And he has a quote from Thomas Aquinas. If the goodness, beauty, and wonder of creatures are so delightful to the human mind, the fountainhead of God's own goodness will draw excited human minds entirely to itself. Hmm. Wasn't Thomas Aquinas Catholic? Yeah. Yeah, it just doesn't mean that uh, they're, they, they don't have something good to say, though. <laughs> no, I'm not trying to burn them at the stake. I'm just, that's, that's a really famous uh, Catholic guy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Martin Luther was Catholic, too, and then he left. Really? But, uh, oh, okay, because I, I, I thought he, he did leave. Okay. Yeah. yeah, and then he broke away from the right. Um, so what will it mean for God to dwell among us? Uh, in Eden, God came down to earth, the home of mankind, whenever he wished. That's Genesis, Genesis 3, 8. On the new earth, God and mankind will be able to come to each other whenever they wish. We will not have to leave home to visit God, nor will God leave home to visit us. God and mankind will live to, together forever in the same home, the new earth. God declares this truth in Scripture. Uh, in Leviticus, he says, I will put my dwelling place among you, and I will not abhor you. I will walk among you and be your God, and you will be my people. In Ezekiel 37, it says, My dwelling place will be with them. I will be their God, and they will be my people. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, it says, I will live with them and walk among them, I will be their God, and they will be my people. <clears throat> so, there certainly is plenty of scripture declaring that, that fact. Now, he says, uh, the marriage of the God of heaven with the people of earth will also bring the marriage of heaven and earth. There will not be two universes, one 
the primary home of God and angels, the other the primary home of humanity. Nothing will separate us from God, and nothing will separate earth and heaven. Once God and mankind dwell together, there will be no difference between heaven and earth. Earth will become heaven, and it will truly be heaven on earth. The new earth will be God's locus, his dwelling place. This is why I do not hesitate to call the new earth heaven, for where God makes his home is heaven. The purpose of God will at last be achieved, quote, to bring all things in heaven and on earth together under one head, Christ Jesus. Ephesians 1.10. Well, this, this uh, doctrine here contradicts uh, preterism. It co contradicts uh, 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 amillennial, amillennialism. Mm -hmm. uh, amillennialism means that, that uh, God and the angels will continue to be in heaven and man will continue to be on earth. Mm -hmm. And uh, just the way it is right now, and, and preterism it teaches the same thing, that, uh, that uh, this is what really shocked me when I was learning all about preterism, is that everything's been fulfilled, therefore uh, we don't have a rapture to look forward to. We just have, we die, we go up to heaven, and they're he they, they go into heaven, but people will continue being born, earth will continue going on in its state as it is now forever and ever, and then there's this separation, there's this eternal existence, for people who put their faith in Jesus in, in, in this other dimension, and then there's this separation of the earth, and that's the way it continues forever. But according to the scriptures, no, the heaven and earth will become one. Predators absolutely makes no sense. I can't even believe that that's actually a doctrine. Well, and to, and to achieve their objective, and, and I agree, Austin, the, the, to achieve the objective of that, you have to eliminate any idea of a physical future of us physically walking with God in a world that He rules, you have to eliminate that. You have and that has to all become spiritual and symbolic, and something else. It has to become something else entirely, because we certainly don't have that now. It's not happening now. Yeah. Um, Christ is certainly not ruling from Jerusalem. He is certainly not ruling in the millennium uh, with a rod of iron, as it's a he. he he certainly has not come again. We would have seen this, and Jesus himself said there'd be no question when his second coming happens. That every eye will see him. Um, so they have to go – they have to somehow twist this to mean that – to take away all that we're talking about here, which is no future relationship in this way of an eternity and a new heaven and a new earth, of a new place like that with God. We have no, none of that to look forward to. Mm -hmm. And you'd have to just basically take a, a whiteout and mm -hmm. white out these three verses I just read mm -hmm. from Le Leviticus, Ezekiel, and 2 Corinthians that clearly say, I will live with them and walk among them. <laughs> okay? I mean, why do people feel the need to change God's specific words that state something that's very easy to understand? That's not a complex statement. It's not trivial. It's not symbolic. It's not... He, he just plain says that that's the way it's going to be. He's going to walk with us. He's going to be – we'll know him in a very physical way. We'll know him face to face. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, um, again, it's, it's just another example of all these things that we, we look forward to that, that some people want to take these things, these, um, this hope that we have of all these things in Scripture, they're taking away all our hopes and, and desires for the future, all these promises. Mm -hmm. um, now, this is an interesting pr premise here. <clears throat> he says, in fact, he's talking about these earth and heaven will become one. They're not these two separate dwelling places. Heaven mm -hmm. and earth are separate. Then he says, <clears throat> in fact, there may not be two universes even now in the divine conspiracy that's a book. Philosophy and theology professor Dallas Willard argues that there is only one universe and, and it's where we'll live forever. And he excerpts this from that book. We can be sure that heaven in the sense of our afterlife is just our future in this universe. There is not another universe besides this one. God created the heavens and the, the earth. That's it. 
And much of the difficulty in having a believable picture of heaven and hell today comes from the century's long tendency to, quote, locate them in another reality, unquote, outside the created universe. But time is within eternity, not outside it. The created universe is within the kingdom of God, not outside it. And if there is anything we know now about the physical universe, it surely is that it would be quite adequate to, to, exter to eternal purposes. And given that it has been produced, which is not seriously in doubt, all that one might require of an utterly realistic future for humanity in it is surely possible. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, so that... Uh, now I, I don't know if he's he's trying to ruling out dimensions. Now universes. He doesn't, he doesn't say that. No, he doesn't say that. He just says other physical universes that there's no need for another entirely different physical universe. He's saying that we know. <coughs> for instance, as, I'm glad you said that word because I was as you as you're reading, I'm thinking the same thing that the angels, for instance, we know angels exist, but they exist in different dimensions that they can come in and out of to manifest themselves to human beings. They've done it all through scripture. Um, yeah. Uh, so these things are going on, and even you know we know Paul. Paul talks about this that about the spiritual warfare that goes on all around us that we cannot see. You know we we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. We wrestle against powers and principalities. Um, you know things that we cannot see and touch, but they're very much there. And I think any Christian who you know, is definitely in tune with the Holy Spirit, has definitely experienced, I know I have personally, for instance, where you go into some place, since I, when I, before I was a Christian, I didn't feel this thing, but when I was, after I became a Christian, after I became born again, I would go to certain places, and I just wouldn't feel right in those places. Spiritually, I felt like something was telling me, get out of this place. You don't belong here. It just didn't feel right. And I would want to get away from these places and not really go back there. It just, you know, I'd find myself spiritually uncomfortable there. I could feel tension. It's like so I think Christians, I think a lot of Christians can say they've experienced that on some level. They could almost feel spiritual warfare, even see it happening in their lives, feel that they're being attacked. You know, um, I def you definitely see that's happening. So we feel these things that we don't see them. Mm -hmm. yes. yeah. I did, yeah, I just had that. I went um, – my buddy, when he was going back to the – he was on – he was a Marine and he was on leave and he was going back to base and he, uh, he just got this girlfriend. He was really excited and – you know, he, he need, she had a friend coming in, so she needed some. He needed somebody to go with him. So I was like, "Yeah, I'll go with you, of course," because he's a cool guy. I would I'd back him up? And then we went to this. Um, I'm not a club guy, and it was the first time I went to one. And man, it was. Uh, it had me clinging to. It had me clinging to the, the spirit, man. It was. It's, it's a madhouse in there, but uh, yeah, exactly. I I feel I've felt that before. Well, there. Um, there's also. Uh, Hmm. Uh, I maybe it was Elijah or Isaiah. There's some Old Testament prophet that uh, God showed him for a moment, uh, open his eyes to see the spirit realm all around him, and he see all the angels who who were fighting for him and and, and winning this battle because he he couldn't see them. So uh, I don't remember where that is, but uh, in other words, it exists all around us, but we we're blind to it. But God can reveal this other dimension uh, that's, that exists right here with us, uh, alongside us right now, uh, and yet we're we don't know it. Maybe sometimes we do sense it, as you said, Eric. We we can feel it, but we don't see it. <clears throat> it says it might be better then if we think of the location of the intermediate heaven as not in another universe, but simply as a part of ours that we are unable to see. Uh, due to our spiritual blindness, <laughs> if that's true, uh, when we die, we don't go to a different universe, but to a place within our universe uh, that we're currently unable to see. Just as blind people cannot see the world, even though it exists all around them, we are unable to see heaven in our fallen condition. Is, is it possible that before sin and the curse, Adam and Eve saw clearly what is now invisible to us? Is it possible that heaven itself is but inches away from us? But death, but does death restore a visual acuity we once had? Willard says, quote, When we pass through what we call death, 
We do not lose the world. Indeed, we see it for the first time as it really is, unquote. Wow. Yeah. I agree to that. I think the, the spirit sometimes is like a temperature. You know, you can't see it go hot or cold, but you can mm -hmm. definitely feel it. Yeah, I agree. And I, th I think there's another side to that too, which is – in our in our sinful state as the people we are you know we we tend to we tend to think wow i'd like to see that i'd like to actually what i wouldn't give to actually see these things that i believe in happening around me but i don't think we could take it i don't think god there's another reason i think god doesn't allow it because i don't think it's something we could take um i think it's something so that would possibly scare us to death. I mean, because seeing these things, I mean, whenever you hear about angels revealing themselves in their glory, you know, before these guys, you know, they all would faint away as if they were dead. They would get this fear, they'd fall on their face, and they you know, start to immediately worship because they're hit with this over overwhelming vision of what the angels actually look like to them, revealed to them for the first time. If we were to see these things in our state happening all the time, it would probably scare us to death. I mean, it would probably we probably wouldn't be able to take it. <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, I've actually had people caution me, uh, kind of as you are there, because uh, I've uh, I've prayed many times. Uh, before I go to sleep, I, I pray that uh, at least let me have a vision, uh, and and if not a vision, um, uh, actually, as Paul as Paul says, whether in the body or not, I don't know. Uh, 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 Paul and John, I believe, went to this third heaven. And uh, that's what I pray for, that I can go and, and see these things. And people say, wait a second, you better be careful. You might not be able to take it. Because <laughs> <laughs> you always see, I had to bring it up, because you always see that same reaction. You know, men, men acted in the same way. I mean, they didn't even know how to respond. They immediately began to worship the, the angels, and the angels immediately said, you know, don't worship us. We're not, we're, we're servants, you know, we're, we, we, you know, do not worship us. So... Um, but that was their national, their natural inclination to do that because they were so overwhelmed by what they're seeing. If we could see the spiritual conflicts that are happening around us, I don't think as fallen human beings in our state, I don't think we could take it. I don't think we could. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know. I'm still pretty interested in, a, in doing I mean, it. But. In a way, in a way. I mean, isn't that sort of what's going to start happening in the tribulation? These things are going to become more manifest. And you see, it even says people will faint. You know, their hearts, their hearts, will, they would, their hearts would seize for fear with the things they're seeing. Yeah. So, yeah. I in a way, in a way, you're seeing that in the tribulation. Yeah, I think that's a, a good example of that. Um, consider this statement: "Quote, God Himself will be with them." Unquote. That's Revelation chapter 21. Why does it emphatically say God himself? Because God won't merely send us a delegate. He will actually come to live among us on the new earth. As Stephen J. Lawson explains, quote, God's glory will fill and permeate the entire new heaven, not just one centralized place. Thus, wherever we go in heaven, we will be in the immediate presence of the full glory of God. Wherever we go, we will enjoy the complete manifestation of God's presence. Throughout all eternity, we will never be separated from direct, unhindered fellowship with God." Unquote. Hmm. I don't know about you guys, I'm getting real excited about it now. <laughs> mm hmm and I it's think like, that's uh, and again this is kind of one of the one of, this speaks to kind of where some of the people are saying during the millennium there will be that separation of Christ and the personage of Christ as we know as we know Christ and his perfected body um, you know in his glorified body as he is but then when we step into the new heavens and the new earth the the personage of the Holy Spirit the Father they will become one again because God Himself the Father will walk with us so there won't be a need for the separation of of these different persons of God and manifestations of God there, he'll he'll be able to walk with us in this one. And I think that's a case that some people make for that. I'm just putting that out there, but that that's the case, and, and that may be the case in eternity. I, I don't know. Um, uh, it makes sense. I mean, that it, yeah. you know, but at the same time, it could be it could be that Christ stays as a separate uh, person in in eternity. Mm -hmm. uh, God's glory will be the air we breathe. 
and we'll always breathe deeper to gain more of it. In the new universe, we'll never be able to travel far enough to leave God's presence. If we could, we'd never want to. However, great the wonders of heaven, God himself is heaven's greatest prize. Father Boudreau writes, quote, the beatitude of heaven consists essentially in the vision, love, and enjoyment of God himself, unquote. Wow. Well, of course, Austin, God. what do you think of that? that, that uh, Father Boudreau said that. Should, should we throw that out? <laughs> Was he Catholic? <laughs> yeah, his, his father, Boudreau. See, that, even, even a, a father, a, even a Catholic priest, you know, can say something that's beautiful about God sometimes. <laughs> um, we can't reject everything just because there are some of their other their uh, salvation doctrine is uh, wrong, you know. The be beatitude of heaven consists essentially in the vision, love, and enjoyment of God himself. How do you re react to that? Is Bedreau, is that Italian? I don't know, but I'm just, I'm asking you about his statement here. The, the beatitude of heaven consists essentially in the vision, love, and and enjoyment of God himself. I mean, we talk about all these things in heaven that we like. I mean, I talk about how I, I would love to be able to play the beautiful golf courses in, in uh, on the new earth, you know. And we talk about uh, all the, the things that we have interest in that we like doing now that we're going to be able to do a lot of these things. And yet, uh, doesn't that all pale in comparison to just being uh, being with God and having this glory of God around us, breathing it all the time. To me, to me, it's just a no-brainer. I mean, I mean, God Himself is heaven's greatest prize. That's what it says here. Um, well, yeah, He made it, <laughs> so obviously He's heaven's greatest prize. Yeah. I mean, without God, there can't be a heaven. So, I mean, like we'll step back to Jackson's comment again about the upgrades. You know. Will we be in this constant state of of um, anticipation of, oh my gosh, what's he going to do next? Oh my gosh, what's he going to do next? You know, I mean, it's like, is it going to be? Will that be part of the relationship too? It's like, you know, it'll be a new discovery, new creativity, new things. You know, will we come to know new things on a constant basis and kind of like sit there saying to ourselves, man, what's he going to do next? What's he going to do next? Mm -hmm. This this makes me. Well, this whole sentence, the sentence right here, is just it is so blows me away. Uh, the beatitude of heaven consists essentially in the vision, love, and enjoyment of God Himself. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, uh, you know, I'm 63, but when I was Austin's age, you know, for that period of my life, you know, uh, I did all the crazy things that young people in my generation did. You know, the the sex, drugs, and rock and roll, and and uh, uh, I did all the different types of drugs that were available at that time, and and you get th these drugs give this feeling of ecstasy. Now, now they, I guess they even have a drug that's named ecstasy. Mm -hmm. Right. But we we t we try to find ways to have this enhance our uh, a pleasure of our feeling, mm -hmm. and uh, feel this ecstasy, this exhilaration of uh, fr we get it artificially through a drug. But is it? Is that what we're going to have in eternity? This always this feeling of bliss and ec ecstasy, just because we're in the presence of God's glory. Right. It's also like uh, the pleasure of sin is but but a short season, and then what we experience in heaven lasts forever. So it's always going to be better. Yeah. That's a very interesting. That's a very interesting uh, insight, Luke. That that's um, the whole thing with what you said about the drugs and things like that. Because you know, we, all we talk about is what Satan does. Is you know, he can't do what God does. All he can do is offer counterfeits. You know, are are those his versions of temporary ecstasies to get worship? You know, are are those are those his counterfeits? You know, mm -hmm. to to get the kind of actual ecstasy that we'll really have in heaven. To to you know. His his mockery of it, his his way to get uh, followers to his side is those temporary little tidbits of it that he knows can't last, but he makes these counterfeit versions of the joys and and uh, pleasures that God is going to give us. Mm -hmm. Where did he get all the knowledge? What? 
the knowledge. Lucifer is the illuminated one because he's illuminated with knowledge. Where did he get all of it from? I mean, well, I mean that's the one thing that you know he tries to my, counter God with. Like that's how he gives power to his followers. He illuminates him with the knowledge. But did he eat of the tree of good and evil? I don't know. We we would only speculate what how he got it because uh, he was considered God's greatest creation as far as. Uh, he was the covering cherubim. He was the uh, um, I forgot all the different titles and and, and uh, responsibilities that, that Lucifer had, and that but it it went to his head. He was made so great that it went to his head, and he thought, well, I'd like to actually take over God's place. <laughs> you know, I, kinda, I want to ascend to this throne on high and occupy that position of God, and that uh, pride went to his head. So, so but God did make him. The, the greatest, uh, as far as I know, it, it maybe Michael and, and uh, Gabriel. Those are the only names of angels, by the way. You got Lucifer, Michael, and Gabriel, and uh, these archangels. Uh, I, I'm not sure if Lucifer was greater than them or if the three of them are equal, but they're considered archangels. Or the, actually, cherubim. He, he was the covering cherubim. Uh, and again, I don't know. Uh, I wouldn't really know how to explain the meaning of all these terms, the covering cherubim and uh, archangel, but uh, where, did he get it? where did he get it? Well, God made him, so God made him that great as far as, uh, but he unfortunately uh, was overcome with pride and rebelled. Uh, okay. Uh, the in heaven will at last be freed of self-righteousness and self-deceit. We'll no longer question God's goodness. We'll see it, savor it, enjoy it, and declare it to our companions. Surely we will wonder how, ev how we ever could have doubted his goodness. For then our faith will be sight. We shall see God. We'll see it, savor it, enjoy it, and declare it. This whole idea of, of being with God and having this glory of God being, it's like, I can't breathe under water, you know, but imagine the water is God's glory and you're submerged, you're immersed into it. And, and then... Uh, and that, that's how that's how I'm getting the picture here that we will be that is immersed in with God's glory, even inhaling it and breathing it. And just it just will be, uh, I guess, ecstatic and bliss. Those are the two. To, to me, I can't think of any better words than bliss and ecstasy. Now, how much? How can you take bliss and ecstasy? I mean, to me, when I think of any moments in my life where I've had this, like, momentary bliss, I don't want to get too explicit, but, you know, there's <laughs> some times where you get uh, a feeling that is just so, so overwhelmingly good. And But could you actually exist in that state all the time? To me, I, to me, I always took it. The best way I could describe it is like it's like imagine the hottest, most dry day that you've ever been out working all day and you're just sweating and you're just dying of thirst. And that cold drink, that feeling you get with that when, when you get that ice cold drink that just quenches that thirst and cools you down and you get out of the heat into the air conditioning, that feeling, it's like magnify that like a hundred thousand times that I mean it's like something we can't really – comprehend I think right? it's it's and that's why I think you don't have a word for it I don't think we have really a current word for it maybe we'll have a word for it in heaven but we don't have a word for it right now because it's just the closest you can come like you said is bliss well, it's, I it's think, um I mean, a perpetual state of um quenching is, is well you know what just came <laughs> to my mind that I think fits perfectly with what we're trying to express you remember in revelation 
when they're just chanting, glory, 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 Lord God Almighty, glory, glory, glory. Maybe that's just what the feeling is, is they're just immersed in this glory of God, and that's all they can say is glory, glory. This is such ecstasy being in the presence of God. And I think you're right, and I think the words don't really do it justice when we read them. I think these are people like if you if you think of going to a stadium when it gets at its loudest and people are cheering and cheering and cheering, I, I, that's what I think it is. You know, it's it's this it's this you know loud beyond comprehension cheering and cheering for the for 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 God's glory and and, and seeing all these things complete. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, many many contemporary approaches to heaven either leave God out or put him in a secondary role. Um, there's a book, The Five People You Meet in Heaven, best-selling novel, portrays a man who feels lonely and unimportant. He dies, goes to heaven, and meets five people who tell him his life really mattered. He discovers forgiveness and acceptance. It sounds good, but the book fails to present Jesus Christ as the object of saving faith. Instead, it portrays a heaven that isn't about God, but uh, about us. A heaven that's not about God's glory, but our healing. And a heaven that's not about God's unfathomable grace to undeserving sinners, but our goodness and self-importance. Man is the cosmic center. God plays a supporting role. This sort of heaven, uh, of which the Bible knows nothing, is a place of therapeutic self-preoccupation rather than preoccupation with the person of Christ. I think he really critiqued him correctly. Mm -hmm. I've, I meet a lot of people that uh, read these books like the five people you you meet in heaven, and there's many other many other books that uh, you know um, basically they're saying this, making the same kind of points. Uh, they talk about heaven and the afterlife, but where's God? Where's where's Jesus? Where's and it, it, it's just all about being with your family, being reunited with your family, or something, or being content, or whatever. But where's God? You know, mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, the, the, but to me. Uh, what the scriptures say and what Randy's emphasizing here is that it's all about being in this presence of God, this glory, glory, glory that we're uh, surrounded and we're, we're breathing in this glory of God. And, and that's, uh, that's the centerpiece of, of this, uh, our eternity. Jonathan Edwards said in a 1733 sermon, quote, God is the highest good of the reasonable creature, and the enjoyment of him is the only happiness with which our souls can be satisfied. To go to heaven fully to enjoy God is infinitely better than the most pleasant accommodations here. Fathers and mothers, husbands, wives, children, or the company of earthly friends are but shadows, but the enjoyment of God is the substance. These are but scattered beams, but God is the sun. These are but streams, but God is the fountain. These are but drops, but God is the ocean. Unquote. Yeah, that's, uh, you know, as I said before, you know, all the things that we think about in eternity, uh, uh, it's all interesting, it's all exciting. Uh, but this part, just being in the presence of God and in the glory of I mean, the glory of God, that is uh, uh, the most exciting thing to me about about eternity. <clears throat> Not only will God come to dwell with us on earth. He will also bring with him the new Jerusalem, an entire city of people, structures, streets, walls, rivers, and trees that is now in the present intermediate heaven. If you've ever seen 
a house being relocated, you appreciate what a massive undertaking it is. God will relocate an entire city, heaven's capital city, the New Jerusalem, from heaven to earth. It's a vast complex containing perhaps hundreds of millions of residences. He will bring it he will bring with it heaven's humans, human habitants and angels as well. <laughs> you know, you know, it's interesting because of what we've been talking about. You know, we talked a lot about the view from Earth and how Earth. You know, we talked about the creation groaning and, and looking you know, all of creation. That's people, animals, the Earth itself. All of creation groans for this. But you know, when you think about it in that way. Heaven is also not complete. The two places are not complete until they're together. And in a way, are both places yearning to be together? I mean, they're split right now, but are, is heaven yearning for the unity with the rest of the creation as much as the creation is yearning to be in unity with heaven? You know, I, I wonder about that. It's a separation that was never really supposed to take place, but it had to. I, I think that point you made there is... is um... Um, agreeing with something we, we discussed in an earlier episode about in, in heaven they are actually observing they're, they're aware of events on the earth whether they are getting reports from angels or whether they're actually viewing it like we view things on a big screen uh, or, or somehow and they are excited and, and plotting and, and it says even time every time someone gets saved, everybody's celebrating in heaven. Mm -hmm. And so I think that they are probably groaning in anticipation to, for everything to be united. Mm -hmm. <coughs> but what about this uh, Austin? This idea of, of transporting an entire city. You, you you've seen these big trucks that have a house sitting on it and they're driving it from one location in the city to, a, to relocate the house on a different plot of land. Well, imagine the entire heaven. The, Jesus is preparing all these mansions. Austin, he's prepared your mansion for you and he's got one for me and Eric and he's, he's going to end up like transporting it, relocating it right here on the earth and this whole city and all of the, the, the saints who are saved and, and the angels, and they're all going to be transported, relocated, like like everybody be coming on a giant bus ride to come here, you know. <laughs> it says he's physically going to do it? Of course, it's physical. It's it, it's it, it exists in a physical state now. No, we, no, no. I mean, like he's physically going to move it, everything, and he just going to speak it, and it's it's going to be. Well, whether he moves it by speaking it or or some other way, it's going to be moved. It's going to be relocated. Mm -hmm. Now he's just using the example of putting it on a bus or a, a, a big, uh, you know. Uh, a 18, what is it, sixteen wheeler or something? Even that's just a human way of explaining it. But however he transports it, whether he just speaks it or or some other way, the idea is it is a city that exists and people that exist right now in this intermediate heaven, and it's all going to be relocated and placed here on Earth as the capital. What do you think of that, Austin? Yeah, I mean it's amazing in its in its essence. Yeah, I mean, it, unbelievable enterprise. I mean, just the the the, the vastness of this this uh, effort, this this project is pretty amazing. But of course, when we compare that to just the, uh, all of all the universe of creation, it's like people tell me. I've used this example many times in the past when people question uh, Jonah and the whale or Noah and the ark, and I say. Why do you question those miracles? Do you, do you believe Genesis 1-1? What, what's that? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. If, that's, if you believe that, if you go, believe God could just create the <laughs> heavens and the earth, all of the universe, just create that by speaking it, then why, do you, why would you ever doubt any of the other miracles? They're minor in comparison. So this relocation of, of, of heaven to the earth, it's really minor, really, project to take on compared to the creation of the heaven and the earth. Amen. 
It appears that God has already fashioned the new Jerusalem. Quote, uh, he has prepared a city for them, unquote. That's Hebrews chapter 11. It doesn't say that God will prepare a city or even that he is preparing it, but that he has prepared it. This suggests that the new Jerusalem, complete or nearly complete, is already there in the intermediate heaven. When God fashions the new earth, he will relocate the city from heaven to the new earth, it's possible that those in the intermediate heaven are already living in it, or it may be set aside waiting simultaneous habitation by all its occupants when transferred to the new earth. Imagine the thrill of beholding and exploring God's city together. And that's something I, I talked about earlier. You know, half the fun of this whole thing is and this is where God comes into it too. It's not just us experiencing these things, but it's experiencing all these things with others and with Him. I mean, who likes to? Who doesn't like to go on a great adventure and not share it with somebody? I mean, you, you want it whenever, like I said before, if you wanted to take a great trip and it was just like the most amazing trip you ever had, what's the first thing you want to do? You want to come back and want to tell people about it. You want to tell them you want to go there. You want to go, you know. It's the same thing. It's the same thing with that. It's not just enjoying these things. It's enjoying them with God and enjoying them together. I mean, it's it's going to be a great because you know. Let's face it. On Earth, unfortunately, most of the things we deal with in this life is stress and work and things like, like that. And those are most of the things that we deal with in life. You know, when's the next bill coming or when's it? You know, vacations and happy times are kind of a lot of them are, are small things sometimes here and there that we get little tidbits that we kind of hang on to because we deal with a lot of bad things in the world, you know? So it's like you're not going to have that in heaven. It's going to be a totally different experience. It'll be nothing but experience these wonderful, great things together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, just discussing this this move of the intermediate heaven and putting on the earth, just exploring that, how that's going to happen, and uh, is, is, is so interesting and exciting to me. It just makes me flash back to the comment we got on one of these videos about, hey, two hours on heaven? How could you talk about heaven for two hours? And yet now we've talked about heaven for 27 hours and 10 minutes. <laughs> and and, and uh, there's so much more to, to learn and discuss about it, and it's all so exciting and interesting. Uh, just this one concept of moving. Is this heaven already... Our, our mansions, the city, the New Jerusalem, is it already built and prepared? Are people living in it or are people waiting to move into it and we're going to all move into it at the same time when it's put on the earth? This is, to me, an amazing whole concept. Well, and, and that comment's very telling because it shows that people, for the most part, have a boring view of heaven, and that confirms it when people leave a message like that, say, two hours about heaven, two hours – that's a very small. That's a drop in the bucket. I mean, we're talking about the the possibilities of what's going on in heaven. When people make that comment, it tells us the answer to our question. We keep asking, you know, do you think people in general have a false idea about heaven? The answer to that question is yes, obviously. And that comment says they do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Who uh who was giving you trouble about heaven, Rose Luke? Oh, this was many episodes ago. It's probably about the you know uh, I think at that time we talked about six episodes so this person was saying how could you talk about heaven for two hours well maybe you should talk about instead of talking about heaven talk about how to get to heaven and of course we don't we don't neglect that every every time we get together for a video we always talk tell people how they get to heaven right it does it just doesn't take two hours to do that <laughs> yeah, you could you could spend yeah. two hours on it, but I mean you could, you but cover I mean, the basis of it. There's no need to. Right? If, yeah. if you tell them how, it doesn't take two hours, but, tight. But the point was, this individual, like so many others, uh, they have this false impression that the, the whole concept and topic of heaven is is just well, there's not that much to it. How could you talk about it for two hours? And here right. we are. We talked about it for 27 hours now, and, and it's that big of a subject. It's that fascinating. That that to me is just sad. It's sad that somebody – I'm not saying the person's sad. I'm saying that the idea is sad that a person believes that heaven is so short on things to talk about. That to me is sad. It really is. It, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is. It is. It's, and it's not only sad that, it, that 
this individual feels that way, but the real sad thing is that the so many people feel that yeah. way. So many, so many Christians feel that way. Yeah. They know so little about it, they seem to have so little interest in it, and yet it's the most thrilling, uh, exciting topic I know of. Um, God's new center of government will be the new earth. This will be the ultimate answer to the Lord's Prayer. Quote, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Matthew chapter 6. God's will shall be done on the new earth as it now is in heaven. Indeed, the new earth shall be a part of heaven, for the veil between the worlds first torn apart by the cross and Christ's resurrection will be permanently removed. There will be no barrier between earth and heaven or between mankind and God. Hmm. Uh, many books and programs these days talk about messages from the spirit realm, supposedly from people who died and now speak through channelers or mediums. They claim to have come from heaven to interact with loved ones, yet almost never do they talk about God or express wonder at seeing Jesus. But no one who had actually been in heaven would neglect to mention what scripture shows in the, is the main focus. If you had spent an evening dining with the king, you wouldn't come back and talk about the place settings. When the apostle John was shown heaven and wrote about it to the church, he recorded the details. But first and foremost, from beginning to end, he kept talking about Jesus. Yeah, that's kind of me, like a litmus test. Uh, if, if someone claims to have had this <laughs> experience uh, and they're not talking all about Jesus and, and it's not conforming to what the, the scriptures are saying about heaven and, and Jesus, then obviously I just I just throw it right out and just dismiss it and, and mm -hmm. uh, yeah. know that it's it's uh, it's not it has nothing to do with 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 God and and, and the truth. Yep. Yeah, I see it as most Christians are like a scary movie. You know, most people like to be scared of. Uh, it's 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 almost in a weird sense, but you know they they're they don't want to go to hell, but yet they always want to hear about the law, and then they complain, "Oh man, I don't think I'll make it and everything." But they never talk about heaven. You know, they that's never the subject of discussion. It's always it's like they're like a scary movie. They like to watch being scared, yet they don't want to have the actual scary movie play out in their lives. You know, they just want to hear about. Ooh, did you make it to go to? Are you going to heaven? Are you going to hell? Oh, I don't know, I don't know. But then you know, when you mention heaven, you know, hey, you going to heaven? You know, heaven's gonna be an awesome place. It's you can never get anything out of them. <laughs> uh, I agree. I've, I've, I've actually had many times in my evangelism, I've had people tell me that they don't want to go to heaven. They don't want to be a Christian. They don't want to go to heaven. They would rather be, go to hell because he heaven sounds seems more like hell to them. It's like boring, monotony, you know, the way that, that so many people see heaven. Uh, they don't, they don't understand the reality of what whatever we've been, everything we've been talking about for 27 hours now. They think it's just some like really monotonous, boring thing, and they think hell sounds much more interesting. You know, parties, drunkenness, orgies, you know, uh, everything that they like, video games, blowing each other up and stuff. You know, just so, um, uh, yeah, this. This topic of heaven is so neglected. It's just such a shame. It's it's. I'm hoping that when we get through this series, that that uh, many people will watch this. Of course, I don't know. It's been 27 hours. It's probably going to be 60 hours by the time we're done, at least. And uh, how many people are going to take on it? Well, you know, there's there's uh, shows on TV that have. Uh, let's say they've. They've been on for a season after season after season, and then you can get it on Netflix or re they show reruns of it. And sometimes I'll watch uh, a marathon and watch like five or six seasons of a show that ended several years ago, and I'll watch like 60 hours of it because it's such a good story uh, and really enjoy it. I'm hoping that some people will see this series on Heaven that we're doing here and take it on the same way and do a marathon and say, 
uh, this is such a wonderful topic. I want to know everything about heaven, and they will really go through it all. Uh, I suspect there will be a few people who do that. Uh, but I uh, so. unfortunately, unfortunately, I think there will only be a few. Now, the 1998 movie, What Dreams May Come, portrays heaven as a beautiful place, yet shows it as lonely because a man's wife isn't there. Remarkably, someone else is entirely absent from the movie's depiction of heaven, and that is God. <laughs> <laughs> no big surprise there. <laughs> wow, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's... Going to heaven without God would be like a bride going to her on her honeymoon without her groom. A heaven without God would be like a palace without a king. If there's no king, there's no palace. If there's no God, there's no heaven. Teresa of Avila said, quote, wherever God is, there is heaven, unquote. The corollary is obvious. Wherever God is not, there is hell. As John Milton put it, quote, thy presence makes our paradise, and where thou, thou art is heaven, unquote. <clears throat> heaven will simply be a physical extension of God's goodness. To be with God, to know him, to see him, is the central irreducible draw of heaven. This book has been really, really helpful to me, and a, such a great blessing to me. I, I remember when I read it the first time, I don't know, five or six, seven years ago, uh, I was, it probably made me happier than I've ever been in my life. And, and as we're going through this again now and discussing it together, I'm, I'm feeling the same thing. I'm just, I have so much happiness, and I wrote, I'm recalling and reliving this experience of, of this anticipation this great desire to be there with God, to be here. God will be here with us. Mm -hmm. And to have this glory and to be able to say glory, 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 and, and just really have this bliss and uh, exhilaration, this ecstasy. So um, it's, it's exciting to me. I, The presence of God. Oh, let me see. I read that. No, you, no, you're right. You're good. The presence of God is the essence of heaven, just as the absence of God is the essence of hell. Because God is beautiful beyond measure, if we knew nothing more than that heaven was God's dwelling place, it would be more than enough. The best part of life on the new earth will be enjoying God's presence having him actually dwell among us, Revelation chapter 21. Just as the Holy of Holies contained the dazzling presence of God in ancient Israel, so will the New Jerusalem contain his presence, but on a much larger scale, on the new earth. The Holy of Holies in the temple at Jerusalem was a perfect 30-foot cube. The New Jerusalem itself will be a perfect cube, one that stretches four hundred miles in each direction. Revelation twenty one sixteen. The only thing I would question in in that is that uh, the 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 geometrical figure of a cube is not the only way of interpreting this the dimensions that we see in that mm. in Revelation when it says um, uh, fourteen hundred miles high, wide, and deep, obviously the first thing that comes to mind is a cube, mm -hmm. but that also would apply to the geometric figure of a uh, pyramid or mm -hmm. also of a sphere. Right. So I don't know if we can come to the conclusion that it's going to be shaped as a cube, uh, but maybe his example of the Holy Holies of being a perfect 30-foot cube, well, maybe that does give credence to it. In the New Jerusalem, there will be no temple, Revelation chapter 21. Everyone will be allowed unimpeded access into God's presence. Quote, blessed are those who uh, may go through the gates into the city, unquote, Revelation 22. 
Heaven's greatest miracle will be our access to God. In the New Jerusalem, we will be able to come phys physically through wide open gates to God's throne. We've been discussing how God's glory is going to be everywhere, and yet it seems like maybe when we go directly to the throne, there it's even more concentrated. I don't, I don't know if that is the case or not. Uh, Jesus promised his disciples, "Quote: I will come back and take you to be with me." that you also may be where I am, John chapter 14. For Christians to die is to be present with the Lord, 2 Corinthians. The Apostle Paul says, I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far, Philippians chapter 1. He could have said, I desire to depart and be in heaven, but he didn't. His mind was on being with his Lord Jesus, which is the most significant aspect of heaven. It really does disturb me that so many people I've encountered in my life, when they think about heaven, they don't even think about being with Jesus. They're just thinking about being in heaven with their, you know, their loved ones, you know, mm -hmm. family and friends that have, have uh, predeceased them, and they think that they're in heaven, and therefore they're going to be reunited with them. And I think. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I look forward to that, but the highlight is to be with Jesus. That's the main attraction. That's the, that's the main, uh, the most satisfying, thrilling part of it is to be with God. I mean, Eric, Austin, I love you guys. I'm going to love to have you have your company up in heaven, but but your, com your company pales in comparison to Jesus. Understood. No, yeah, it's understood. I mean, to me, Jesus... God, God, he's the he's the answer to all the questions. He's that's the best way I could put God. He he's the answer to all the questions. You know, in just four, in forty one years of my life, I have accumulated a lot of questions <laughs> that I simply do not have the answers to, and I had, don't have any hope of getting the answers. And I want the answers to those questions, and I have to be content with the fact that right now I don't have them. And that's fine because God has not seen fit to give me those answers yet. But I know there's a day where he's going to answer those questions, and I want that day. I mean, and he to me, he's the, he's the keeper of the keys. He's the one holding the answers to all the questions. And of course that's why I want to see him. I, I, I want to sit down with my Savior. I, I want to... Like we talked about nostalgia, I want to look over my life. Sure, I know there's going to be things I'm not going to like that I'm going to see, but I'm sure there's going to be – it's going to pale to the wondrous things and the great things that I'm going to see. You know, And that's the way Christ is going to present that because that's what that time is all about. And to spend that time with him looking over my life is an important thing and having the questions answered. To me, I, I don't know. That's like – again, it's another whole adventurous discovery type of thing. And – like I said, he's the keeper of all the keys. He's he's the he has all the answers to the questions, and that to me drives me. I want to know the answers to these questions. Mm -hmm. You know, the, I mentioned the video I just made about uh, homemade Bible tracks, and uh, I have about you know a dozen verses that I review in that, and one of them is Jesus saying, "I am the way, the truth, and the life." And I talk about the truth in that verse applying to the truth. The truth that we need to know for salvation is Jesus is the answer. He's the truth that you need to know. But he, he really is truth in much broader sense. All truth is uh, from Jesus. There's nothing, there's no truth that you're going to get anywhere that doesn't come from Jesus. He mm -hmm. is the truth. Mm -hmm. So the answer to all your questions, the correct true answer you're going to get from Jesus Christ, and yeah, there's a lot we don't know, and even in eternity, there's there can always be a lot we don't know because uh, I think it's going to omniscience, all knowledge, is an inexhaustible source of data uh, that that we we are going to be consuming and learning uh, throughout eternity. So it to me that's another very exciting part of eternity is continuing to learn and and to gather all that information. Um, 
Samuel Rutherford said, quote, Oh, my Lord Jesus Christ, if I could be in heaven with it, without thee, it would be a hell. And if I could be in hell and have thee still, it would be a heaven to me. For thou art all the heaven I want, unquote. Martin Luther said, quote, I had rather be in hell with Christ than be in heaven without him, unquote. A place with Christ cannot be hell, only heaven. A place without Christ cannot be heaven, only hell. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. Uh, it's it just, it, it just, I'll repeat it again. I'm astounded by all the people I've known when the subject of heaven comes up and they talk, 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 talking about heaven. There's no mention of Jesus. There's no mention of God. It's only a mention of, you know, my father, my my mother, my my sibling, my best friend. You know, I'll be with them. It's just it's it's really sad that the the idea that they've lost they've lost sight of the really the 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 whole point is is to be with God in eternity. Right, go home to see your baby. The, that is one thing I was going to say is that um, the most the most people I ever hear talk about heaven is the lost world. You know, the, they're always the ones saying, "Oh man, when I get to heaven, you know, it's going to be like this, this, this." You know, they throw their worldly lusts in the in heaven. Yet the Christians themselves, the ones who actually, you know, faith alone, the ones that are entitled to it, don't even say anything about it. That's that's a pretty sad thing that the lost the, the lost sinner would talk more about heaven than someone who's actually going to go there. Yeah, you yeah. know, that's something interesting Austin said. The other side of that, too, is, um, you know, I wonder if that's indicative of their people's faith. And that's what I think is one of the key problems with having a faith that is so steeped in your own works. It's not steeped in what Christ did. It leaves you with this feeling with, are they not eager to see Christ because they are on a constant guilt trip about Everything that they do, they don't know the freeness of not being on a guilt trip because Christ takes that away from you. And for me, sure, do I feel guilty about my sins? Sure, I feel guilty about my sins. I mean, anytime I sin, of course I feel bad, you know. Um, but I know that that Christ's way is not to sit there and push me under His thumb and say, "No, you, I want you to keep feeling bad about that and keep feeling bad about it." That's not what He does. You know, He takes that away and says, "You know, I wash you of that, I clean you of that, and so you can come into My presence with great joy, knowing that this isn't going to be something that I'm going to club you over the head with when we get together." Do these people who live by the philosophy of, "No, My works, My works, My works," I got to, uh, you know, do they realize their works don't measure up? <laughs> and that they're not too eager to see them because they're afraid that they're they're constantly in this state that they're afraid their works aren't going to measure up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The uh, before we started the show today, somehow I got on uh, YouTube and was watching some street preaching videos of of people who are uh, you know a lot of these street preachers I know and I've worked with, and I was watching that and and just it reminded me again of how. Uh, they do not emphasize the love of God, and they emphasize the fear of God. Mm -hmm. In fact, they'll come out right and say, uh, no, God does not love you. You're a sinner. God does not love sinners. And, and uh, they, they, I've gotten in arguments with them in the past, but I'm telling people how much God loves them, and they say, don't tell them that. Tell them God yeah. hates them because they're a sinner. But it seems to me that the people that assume that God loves them are the lost people. They are more, much more likely to think, "Well, God loves me. God loves me," you know, uh, and think everything's okay because God loves me, and that's true. God does love them, but everything's not okay until they put their faith in the Savior. Okay? Right. Uh, that's the part that they've left out. They understand, yeah, God loves us all, and 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 He died for all of our sins. But you can't get eternal life unless you put your faith in the Savior. So they they, they missed the most important part, but. These uh, a lot of Christians, they 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 are not uh, emphasizing or uh, teaching. Sometimes even purposely omitting this the the fact that God loves us so much that He gave us His only begotten Son. That that uh, uh, God God is uh, uh, loves us in spite of our sin. 
even though we're you know, while we're yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's, that's the key. That's the, I knew Austin was going to jump on it too. I knew, that's yeah. the key right there. When people come out and say things like that, I hate when people say things like that. God doesn't love them they, because we did. The world did absolutely nothing to deserve Christ coming. There was nothing that they did. To you know that that the world suddenly collectively came together, did this wonderful thing, and everybody was fell in fellowship and love. And God says, "Well, now because you've done that, I'm going to send Christ." And no, it's that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He did this, and and what you said, Luke, is something I use all the time. I said, "Christ doesn't love us because of what we do. Christ loves us." and forgives us despite what we do. And that's the real love of Christ. It's that he forgives us as long as we accept him because until the day we die, we're constantly flawed. This blows the idea of living holy or or living perfect and sinless, blows it out the door. You know, he his love for us isn't that he died. It covers the fact that we can't cover it and that he does that despite who we are, not because of something we did. Mm -hmm. Right, and then you know God commended his his love toward us. Is that why we're at sinners? Christ died for us. He commended his love towards us, not yeah. took it away. No, it was the ultimate act of love. Despite the fact we didn't deserve it, he sent it. And it, yeah, I don't see where people miss that. <laughs> now those street preachers, that someone that legalistic, sounds like they wouldn't be teaching faith alone. Did they teach faith alone? Um. There's hardly any street preachers that I know of that, that are teaching the, the true message of salvation. Okay, because I was going to say similar to that part of a message can't be that can't be sound that much. Yeah, yeah. Um, then uh, Randy says we'll worship Jesus as the Almighty and bow to Him in reverence, yet we'll never sense His disapproval because we'll never disappoint Him. He'll never be unhappy with us. We'll be able to relax in heaven. The other shoe will never drop. No skeletons will fall out of our closets. Christ bore every one of our sins. He paid the ultimate price so that we would never so that we would be forever free from sin and the fear of sin. All barriers between us and him will be forever gone. He will be our best friend. Mm-hmm. Yeah. When Jesus prays that we will be with him in heaven, he explains why. Quote, Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory the glory you have given me be, because you loved me before the creation of the world, unquote. That's John chapter 17. When we accomplish something, we want to share it with those closest to us. Likewise, Jesus wants to share with us his glory, his person, and his accomplishments. There's no contradiction between Christ acting for his glory and for our good. The two are synonymous. Our greatest pleasure, our greatest satisfaction is to behold his glory. Hmm. Yeah. I'm really anticipating what that's going to be like. If we can... And I can only imagine, you know, I get back to that song again, when we first see Jesus face to face, and we, we, we are confronted with the glory of God, Jesus Christ. And, uh, you know, I, I can only imagine what it's going to be like. Uh, but I, I, can, I cannot imagine anything greater than that. Christ's desire for us to see his glory should touch us deeply. What an unexpected compliment that the creator of the universe has gone to such great lengths at such sacrifice to prepare a place for us where we can behold and participate in his glory. Jesus indwells us now, and perhaps he will then, but he will also physically reside on the earth with us. Have you ever imagined what it would be like to walk the earth with Jesus as the disciples did? 
Have you ever wished you had the, that opportunity? You will on the new earth. Whatever we will do with Jesus, we'll be doing with the second member of the triune God. What will it be like to run beside God, laugh with God, discuss a book with God, sing and climb and swim and play catch with God? Jesus promised we would eat with him in his kingdom. This is an intimacy with God unthinkable to any who don't grasp the significance of the incarnation. To eat a meal with Jesus will be to eat a meal with God. <laughs> I throw the pig skin around with Jesus is going to be pretty amazing. You know something? I, I'm glad, Austin, I'm glad you said that because it's like Luke talked with like playing golf with Jesus or, your, or whatever. You know what? This And this puts into perspective why the focus of heaven has got to be mostly Jesus. It's got to be mostly being with God. God is like the best friend you ever had ever in your existence. He's your absolute best, unquestionably best friend. He will never stab you in your back. He's never stabbed you in your back. He has given his life for you. He's done – no friend or family member on earth has ever done all the things that God has done for you, ever. Amen. Now, now – who do you most like to share things with? Your best friends, your friends, our brotherhood, our, our brotherhood here. We love sharing things with each other. Like you said, Luke, we get off the show, and we've had some of the best conversations we've had after we get off, and we're talking, and we talk about a whole bunch of things. We just fellowship and just on a friendly basis, you know, as family, you know, as brothers, we talk. Well, imagine reliving, your, going over your whole life experiences and then future experiences with God, your ultimate best friend, the, 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 the best friend you could ever possibly have. That's going to be a really cool experience. I mean, that's going to be sharing things with a person that you know legitimately is deeply involved and most deeply involved in your life than anybody ever has been and is the most excited to share these things with you in your experiences and your personality more than anybody else in your life. I mean, that, that right there is, is an amazing thing to experience with God. Yeah, he's basically cheating. He's everything. He's your best friend. He's the, the best person you go to get advice. He'd be the best person to go to yeah. church or anything. He'd be there for you. I mean, it's, he's there in everything, and he fills every position. Yeah. So he's a person. He's definitely the person you most want to share all these experiences with. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, Jesus said that uh, um, uh, at a certain point, he said, uh, no longer will you will I, you'll be my disciples, but you'll be my friend. I forgot the verse and how it's phrased exactly. Mm -hmm. but it's he, John, yeah. And, and, and then, he, then he goes on to say uh, he would lay down his life for us. He says, there is no greater love than to give your life, life for, a for your friend. That's right. And so, yeah, this is he is emphasizing this idea that we 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 can embrace him as our friend, mm -hmm. our God, our Creator, our friend. Uh, just there's there's so much to this relationship. <laughs> uh, and then let's say that there's a million people, or a billion people that are saved in in eternity. I don't know the, what the number is going to be, and yet. Jesus somehow is going to be able to have this relationship with every one of us, even I think even simultaneously. It's not like there's going to be a, you take a number at the deli. <laughs> It'd be a long uh, wait. Yeah. <laughs> now serving 4,500,000. <laughs> yeah. Everybody take a number, wait for your turn to talk, about, talk to Jesus. No, it seems like at, any, at all time, any time we'll have access to Jesus, everybody. So somehow he'll be able to do this because he's God. He can, he can do that. He can be uh, omnipresent. Wow, that's exciting. Jesus said, quote, It will be good for those servants whose master finds them watching when he comes. I tell you the truth. He will dress himself to serve, uh, will have them recline at the table, and will come and wait on them. Luke chapter 12. This is an amazing passage. Jesus says that the master will do something Culturable, culturally unthinkable, become a servant to his servants. Why? Because he loves them, and also out of appreciation for their loyalty and service to him. The king becomes a servant, making his servants kings. Notice that he won't merely command other servants to serve them. 
he will do it himself. God, it's just like, you know that scene where Jesus is, washes the feet of the apostles. And then Peter, you know, he decides, he, no, you're not going to wash my feet, you know, because uh, uh, he, he thought he was being really great by saying, no, I'm, I'm, I'm not worthy to have you wash my feet. You're too great to wash my feet. And yet Jesus wanted to give, do this as an example of how we should serve each other. And uh, the greatest among you will be the servant of all. So he does this to demonstrate this principle, and Peter does not want to allow it. And he says, if you don't let me wash your feet, then leave. You I, You can have no part with me. You have no part with me, right? And yet, so uh, here he is serving uh, in that way. Uh, and here, this example is talking about he's going to be serving us and not hiring, not not having appointing some other an angel or somebody else to serve us, but he'll be serving us himself. It's, it is mind-boggling to think that, that this God that created the universe is going to be serving us. <laughs> wow. We will be in heaven only because, quote, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Matthew chapter 20. We must assent to Christ's service for us. John chapter 13. Uh, that's probably the reference to Peter there, huh? But even in heaven, it appears Jesus will sometimes serve us. Uh, what greater and more amazing reward could be ours in the new universe than to have Jesus choose to serve us? Uh, if it was our idea that God would serve us, it would be blasphemy. But it's his idea. As husbands serve their wives and parents serve their children, God desires to serve us. Quote, on this mountain the Lord Almighty will prepare a feast of riches, rich food for all peoples. Unquote. Isaiah chapter 25. God will be the chef. He'll prepare us a meal. In heaven, God will overwhelm us with his humility and his grace. I think I think where people lose sight of this is they tend to see this, the service and saying God serving and Jesus serving, um, they they see it as a um, lowering or debasing of themselves to be subservient. But he's not doing it for that reason. He's doing it because he loves us, not because he's trying to make himself lower than us, which is what Peter didn't really understand. He's saying, I'm doing this out of love for you. Now, I, I know you're, I know I'm greater than you. I know I am. I, I don't need you to tell me that. I'm aware of that. What I'm, I'm doing this because I want to show you my love for you. That, that's why he's doing it. Mm -hmm. Amen. I like how Randy made this, he drove this point home. Um, uh, Oh, yeah, he says, uh, um, it's his idea, as husbands serve their wives and parents serve their children, God desires to serve us. I can identify with that. Right. I mean, obviously, uh, I there's no, um, it's a wonderful thing to be able to serve your wife and your children and your friends and the people that you love and care about. It's, a, it's not like a... Uh, uh, burdensome thing. It's a pleasure that you can do something for them. Right, exactly. And it, that's exactly that's exactly what I was saying. And people tend to tend to see it the other way, but that's not it. It's it's something done out of love. You know, it's it's something done out of the fact that we want to see. For, it's like, for instance, it's like our concept of you know Christmas time. We we give. You know, we go out of our way to give other people things. Why? Because we want to see that look on their face. We want to see that. We want to see that smile. That that response of thank you so much for doing this for me. You know, that, that's that's what we that's what we want to do it for. That's what he does it for. Mm -hmm. uh, both God the Father and God the Son are portrayed as reigning on thrones in heaven. But what will be the Holy Spirit's role? The answer isn't spelled out in detail, but we can surmise that he'll be involved in creating the new heavens and the new earth. Uh, he may continue to indwell believers, 
Uh, he'll empower us to rule wisely with Christ. He may still move our hearts to glorify and worship the Father and the Son. He'll continue forever as their companion in the triune Godhead. That is an interesting question. What is the Holy Spirit's role in eternity? Um, if you had the opportunity to spend the evening with any person who's ever lived, whom would you choose? Probably someone fascinating, knowledgeable, and accomplished. High on my list would be C.S. Lewis, A.W. Tozer, Jonathan Edwards, Hudson Taylor, and Charles Spurgeon. Or how about Ruth, David, Mary, Paul, or Adam and Eve? I'd enjoy meeting Eric Liddell, the great runner and Christ follower portrayed in Chariots of Fire. Perhaps you'd choose someone beautiful and talented. Maybe you'd hope that at the end of the evening, he or she would have enjoyed your company enough to want to spend time with you again. Is Jesus the first person you would choose? Who is more beautiful, talented, knowledgeable, fascinating, and interesting than he? The good news is he chose you. If you're a Christian, you'll be with him for eternity and enjoy endless fascinating conversations and experiences. Incredibly, he'll also enjoy your company and mine. After all, he paid the ultimate price just so he could have us over to his place for eternity. <laughs> Most of us would love to spend the evening with a great author, musician, artist, or head of state. God is the master artist who created the universe, the inventor of music, the author and main character of the unfolding drama of redemption, head of state. He's the king of the entire universe. Yet if someone says, I want to go to heaven to be with God forever, others wonder, wouldn't that be boring? <laughs> what are we... What are we thinking? The very qualities we admire in others, every one of them, are true of God. He's the source of everything we find fascinating. Who made Bach, Beethoven, and Mozart? Who gave them their gifts? Who created their music? Uh, who created music itself and the ability to perform it? All that is admirable and fascinating in human beings come from their creator. That is a really an amazing point that he makes here is that when you think of all the people that you find interesting that and talents that you value and yet they all of that is is comes god is the source of it all mm -hmm. uh i think it's an interesting question uh you know have you ever thought about who you'd like to to meet and spend time with like, you know, some of these uh, famous people. Uh, I've often thought you know, different people in the Bible, or, you know, the Apostle Paul has always been one of my top choices. I'd like to have a chance to get to know him, and, mm -hmm. and uh, he's one of my great heroes. I admire him so much from the scriptures, and yet when we think of people, well, why would we not immediately <clears throat> make Jesus our first uh, <laughs> automatic, automatic thought would be with him? Right. Okay, um, in a sense, we're already in heaven with Christ. Since then, quote, since then you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God, set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you'll also appear with him in glory. That's Colossians chapter 3. Mm -hmm. Our intimate link with Christ in his redemptive work makes us inseparable from him, even now. As we walk with him and commune with him in this world, we experience a faint foretaste of heaven's delights and wonders. Though it's true that Christ is with us and within us while we're on earth, it also works in the other direction. We are united with Christ, so much so that we are seated with him in heaven. Quote, God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, Ephesians 2, verse 6. I've thought about that many times. 
You know, how is that even possible? But we are already seated in heavenly places right now. Hmm. Notice that the following description written to believers alive on earth is in the present perfect, not future tense, which expresses a completed action. Quote, you have come to Mount Zion, to the heavenly Jerusalem, the city of of the living God, you have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful uh, assembly, to the church of the firstborn whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God, the judge of all men, to the spirits of righteous men uh, made perfect." Unquote. That's Hebrews chapter 12. In a metaphysical sense, we've already entered into, uh, already entered heaven's community by seeing ourselves as part of the heavenly society, we can learn to rejoice now in what heaven's residents rejoice in. They rejoice in God, His glory, His grace, and beauty. They rejoice in repentant sinners, the saints' faithfulness and Christ-likeness, and the beauty of God's creation. They rejoice in the ultimate triumph of God's kingdom and the coming judgment of sin. Heaven, then, isn't only our future home. It's our home already, waiting over the next hill. If we really grasp this truth, it will have a profound effect on our holiness. A man who sees himself seated with Christ in heaven, in the very presence of God, of a God to whom the angels cry, holy, 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 won't spend his evenings viewing internet pornography. No wonder the devil is so intent on keeping us from grasping our standing in Christ. For if we see ourselves in heaven with Christ, we'd be drawn to worship and serve him here and now, creating ripple of, uh, creating ripples in heaven, uh, in heaven's waters that will extend outward for all eternity. That is an uh, amazing concept. I've often tried to comprehend it. I don't think I don't think I really get it completely. But the idea that uh, we're all already seated. Here I am here now, and yet the scripture says I'm already in heaven and seated in heavenly places. Um, you guys got an answer for that one? It, it, it definitely does and should um, alter your focus about, you know, uh, your, your compass. It should alter the compass guiding you through life because you sh you really should think think of yourself and look at yourself and say to yourself, should I really be doing this right now? Should I be saying that? Should I? Be? I mean, here I am, a son of God, with a place reserved for me. Got a seat with my name on it, you know, reserved for me in this place where God has done all these things for me and and has made me worthy, though I'm not. It does make you come back and reevaluate your actions and kind of keep you on the right footing as a Christian because it should humble you and it should put you, you know, in that position where you should say, if God's done all that for me, so much for me, I should want to live pleasing to Him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it does have that kind of effect of, 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 uh, uh, well, some people say that. The Holy Spirit doesn't convict us. It's the uh, uh, it's Satan who's the accuser, always trying to convict us and point the finger at us. Uh, but the the Holy Spirit convinces us. It convinces us of the truth of our situation, and uh, and so uh, I think the Spirit is prompting us and making us aware and putting it all in perspective. And this example of if we can keep in mind that we're already in heavenly places, and that. Uh, uh, we are much more likely to uh, to do things, live our lives in a way that uh, you know are, are is an example for others, and, and that is pleasing to our Savior. Right, Austin. How is it possible that we're I'm here now, and I'm also in heaven right now? Still there, sorry. Austin? Yeah, I'm sorry. I I didn't catch a question. How is it possible that I'm here right now here in Las Vegas, sitting in front of my computer, but it says I'm already seated in heavenly places too? That, that oh, that your that your soul's been uh, saved. You're kept by the power of God unto salvation by like you're in His hand. 
Mm-hmm. The okay. phrase the phrase that gets me that I think most about is the reason for that is because three words it is finished. You know when when Christ says it is finished, it's a done deal. That's why you can say that about yourself. That though you you know yourself better than anybody else, you know your failings better than anybody else. But to have that seat there already done, I'm already sitting there. It's because of his words. It is finished. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. And and to me the the uh, the idea of being in Christ. It makes it Christ is there, and you and I we're all in Christ, so therefore we're there in that in that respect. Okay, guys, uh, we'll pick up with the next chapter next time. Uh, let Let's take a, a minute now. We're talking about it doesn't take two hours to tell people how to how to receive this gift of eternal life in heaven. We've been telling them all about the wonderful things we have to look forward to in heaven and the new earth and all that, uh, but we don't want to neglect telling them how they can have it. And so, But it doesn't take that long, does it? Uh, uh, we, we could probably tell someone in a matter of just a few seconds or a few minutes, uh, but how, how would you say it, Brother Austin? If someone says, this heaven sounds really, really good. You got me really excited now. Now, now, what do I have to do so I can, I can have this eternal life in heaven with, with Jesus and the saints and all this, you know, bliss and ecstasy? I could. Uh, would you want me to read my track? No, I don't care how you do it, brother. Just uh, you can just. I was hoping you could just tell them in your own words. Okay. No, absolutely. I was just seeing just if you want me to read my, uh, read my track. I would just say that. Um, uh, it's a, it's a free gift paid in full by the blood of Jesus Christ, and it's already there. It's just any time that uh, you want to get saved, all you have to do is place your full trust and faith alone in Christ, and He will save you forever at that moment, and you can never lose it because you did nothing to get it, and there's nothing you can do to lose it. Amen. Amen. Let me ask you a couple of follow-up questions. That you said that it's paid in full by the blood of Christ, and how how was that accomplished? At the Christ Jesus paid for everybody's sins at the cross at Calvary, and his blood was shed for all. Uh, he died for the sins of the world, was buried, and rose again three days later. And then that symbol that uh, symbolizes that, or not symbolizes that, is a reference to know that um, Christ is no mere man. He was God as he said he was, and that's why he came back from the dead. Mm hmm. So how, why, how would you say that, that uh, uh, Jesus is worthy of, putting our, of, of us really putting our confidence in him? What is, the, what is the proof that you can give someone to say, hey, you can trust Jesus. You know, he is worthy, and, and uh, he can do what he said. He, he can do what he promised. He was sinless and perfect, and he was – are you, 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 you mean you want me to find him a verse that says that? No, what, did, what was the, the event that, that proves that uh, he does have this power of life and death? The resurrection? Yes. So we have the cross is, is what paves the way so that we can have eternal life because he's paid for our sins. And the resurrection is the, is the sign, the proof that tells us Jesus does have this power. He, he does have the power of life and death, and, and, and he is worthy to put your trust in him. Uh, you can trust him because he proved it through his raising himself from the dead. He has the power to raise you from the dead and give you eternal life, right? Yes, uh, absolutely. Yeah. So, so, uh, so, brother, brother Eric, what would you add to that and, and conclude that a person must do? I would say that you know we all fall short, as we've mentioned before in our in the videos. You know, we we all fall short of God's perfection. And to enter heaven, uh, we have to be in that state. But the good news is that God, he tells us he, there, there's no, nothing we can do to save ourselves. That Our trust has to be completely at, on his finished work, what he has provided, because he's only the one who can perfect this. He's the only one who can do it. And it's simply trusting God. To say, you, to say you believe in Jesus Christ as your Savior is to tell God, I trust you, God. I trust what you have done, and I take your word for what you said is enough. You've done the work. You've done it for me. All I need to do is accept this, and it is that simple. All I need to do is accept it. I'm saying I trust God's word. I believe him. Mm-hmm. Amen. Amen. Okay, brothers, I, I want to thank you for uh, participating. 
It's always a, 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 a joy and pleasure to discuss the scriptures with you. And uh, anybody who's watching this video, if you're excited about heaven now, and uh, now you know what you must do. Put your faith completely in our great Savior God. His name is Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you for watching.